Good morning and welcome to our service of worship today. I hope that you are well and if you have been sick with COVID, we have been praying for you and we have been praying for your recovery and so we hope that you are feeling uh, a lot better and that your condition is improving. We continue with our series uh, entitled The Question I Want to Ask Is and the question we're looking at today is why is it that Christians do evil? So we're going to begin our time of worship with a call to worship that we will say together and then we're going to sing a wonderful hymn that speaks of the growth of God's kingdom and the way it starts from something small and grows into something big. All of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. But it is not just creation alone which groans. We also groan within ourselves as we wait for God to make us his children and set our whole being free. See how great a flame aspires, kindled by a spark of grace. Jesus loved the nation's fires, sets the kingdoms on a blaze. To bring fire on earth he came, kindled in some hearts it is. Oh, that all might catch the flame all partake the glorious bliss when he first the work begun small and feeble was his day now the word doth swiftly run now it wins its widening way more and more it spreads and grows ever mighty to prevail sin strongholds it now or throws shakes the trembling gates of hell saints of god your savior praise who the door hath opened wide he hath given the word of grace jesus word is glorified Jesus mighty to redeem, who alone the work hath wrought. Worthy is the work of him, him who spake a word from naught. Saw ye not the cloud arise, little as a human hand. Now it spreads along the skies, hangs o'er all the thirsty land. Lo, the promise of a shower drops already from above, but the Lord will shortly pour all the spirit of his love. And now let us pray together. You are the Christ who is making all things new. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. In you we are renewed, our thirst quenched, our spirits strengthened. Because of your saving presence on the earth, we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, to a time when chaos will be something of the past, to a time when you will wipe every tear from our eyes, when there will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. You, O Christ, are our hope, our strength, our present, and our future. And yet in the darkness of life, we need you to show us the light, for we don't always see it. In the midst of brokenness and pain, we need you to show us the way to healing, for we can't find that way on our own. In our own angst and anger and guilt, 
We need you to give us the peace only you can give. In our sin, we need you to search our hearts and to lead us to offer the areas of our life where we are self-obsessed to you. For only you can change us. Only you can give us life. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Our Amen. first reading this morning is from the second book of Samuel, chapter 12 and verse 7 to 9. And we pick up the part of the story where the prophet Nathan confronts David on his sin with Bathsheba. You are that man, Nathan said to David. And this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I made you king of Israel and rescued you from Saul. I gave you his kingdom and his wives. I made you king. Why then have you disobeyed my commands? Why did you do this evil thing? You had Uriah killed in battle. You let the Ammonites kill him. And then you took his wife. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6 and from verse 1 to 7. What shall we say then? Should we continue to live in sin so that God's grace will increase? Certainly not. We have died to sin. How then can we go on living in it? For surely you know that when we were baptized into union with Christ Jesus, we were baptized into union with his death. By our baptism then, we were buried with him and shared his death in order that, just as Christ was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so also we might live a new life. For since we have become one with him in dying as he did, in the same way we shall be one with him by being raised to life as he was. And we know that our old being has been put to death with Christ on his cross, in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed, so that we should no longer be the slaves of sin. For when we die, we are set free from the power of sin. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. A few weeks ago, I watched the film Gangs of New York. And uh, it is a story which is set in uh, New York in the mid-1800s, uh, a time that featured uh, wars between gangs, it featured conflict between the resident Protestants and the uh, mainly Catholic Irish immigrants, and it also features the exploitation of the urban poor by a few rich business people. Towards the end of the film, there is a scene in which the two gang bosses are preparing to lead their gangs into a vicious and deadly battle. And one of the ways in which they prepare themselves for this is by praying, committing their cause to God and asking God to give them victory. Alongside these scenes is the scene of one of the wealthy businessmen living in uh, an opulent home, sitting down with his family to feast on a sumptuous meal. And before they eat, thanking God for all of his blessings and he, the favour he has bestowed upon him. And one looks at these scenes and says, what kind of Christianity is depicted there? How is it that the people who profess to follow Christ can reconcile their faith with the evil that they are part and parcel of? Well, the film, of course, depicts a very sad reality about our Christian faith, and it is the reality that 
Often those who profess to follow Christ are people that do what is wrong and what is immoral and what is evil. So, some examples. We had the Crusades. Did you know that the Crusader army has put to death nearly three million people? And they marched under the banner of the cross. Millions of people were killed in wars between Christians fought in Europe and fought in Northern Ireland. In the United States, certain Christian groups supported and validated the decision for America to invade Iraq on false pretexts. In South Africa, the superiority and the entitlement of white people was supported and validated on the basis of Scripture. And then, of course, in our own country, we have seen pastors who have been brought to trial for the most atrocious and shocking acts of, of evil. Child trafficking, rape, extortion, money laundering. And so today we discuss this very interesting topic that was um, proposed. Why is it that those who call themselves Christians can do such things? And we're going to be uh, uh, guided in two questions that arise out of the readings. And the first is from 2 Samuel, where the prophet Nathan says to David, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil? And then secondly, from Romans chapter 6, the question, Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? So, first of all, let us make some statements about why it is that Christians do what is evil. Two main reasons. And the first is the tendency that Christians have to privatize their faith. To make faith a matter of what I myself believe. To make it a matter of my private relationship with God and my going to heaven. It's all about me and my God. The second reason is that we have a tendency to spiritualize our faith. We make our faith all about the salvation of my soul, about my belief of a God who is way away in heaven. We make it about our rituals of prayer and of worship to that far away God. And we make it about the inward life of the church. And the results of this kind of privatized and over-spiritualized faith is that self-interest or sin is simply not dealt with. In fact, we feel justified in pursuing what it is that we particularly desire. We feel that it, it, we are justified in making our personal happiness the main focus of our life's agenda. And this is exactly what we see in David, who sins with Bathsheba. It's about him. It's about his desires. It is about what he wants. It is about his personal gratification. Privatization and spiritualization results in a second thing, and it is that the suffering of people, the needs of others, the injustice of society, the degradation of the environment, somehow don't feature in our faith. They are unimportant. They are irrelevant in a spiritualized 
and privatized faith. Because, after all, salvation is not about what we have materially. It's about my soul going to heaven. And anyway, at the end of time, all material things in the earth are going to be destroyed and everything will become spiritual. A third thing that results from the privatization and spiritualization of our faith is that our practical behavior is not driven by Christ but is rather driven by our ideology or it is driven by our loyalty to our country or our ethnic group or our political party or the company we work for or the family that we are part of. These things take the way of Christ. And so it is out of these kinds of things that I have mentioned that behavior arises in Christians that is a complete contradiction of what we profess and of the person we profess to follow. Now this brings us to our need to hear again and to refocus on the call of Christ. And that is because the evil that Christian, Christians do is not just about other people that we read about and that we hear about on our TVs. It is also about us because the temptation to privatize and spiritualize our faith is a temptation that all of us are faced with. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about cheap grace. And cheap grace is very attractive to all of us. It's about a Christianity which assures us that we are okay and we are going to heaven, but demands very little from us in terms of sacrifice and in terms of costs. And so when we embrace such a cheapness of grace, we become Christians that are described by my colleague John Vessels in his book, Missing Jesus, in these words. Too many Christians hold beliefs and lifestyles that are exploitative, unjust, ungracious, greedy, oppressive, pretentious, judgmental, unloving, narcissistic, lazy, violent, and expedient. Now we are not all of these things obviously unless of course we are like really really bad but we may find ourselves somewhere in this list if we are honest enough. And so where do you find yourself in this list? And so we need to hear again the call of Jesus upon our lives. And his call is firstly a call for transformation. Jesus came and he said, repent and believe the good news. Paul frames it a little differently where he talks about us embracing a kind of faith in which we don't sin because we are dead to sin. We don't sin because our natural self has been crucified with Christ. And so the call of Christ upon us is always a call for deep inward and personal transformation. A transformation and a change in our will, in our thinking, in our attitudes and in our behaviour. Secondly, the call of Christ is a call to discipleship. Jesus came to his disciples uh, saying to them, follow me. And so his call is to follow him in a life of love and in a life of servanthood. 
It is a call that what needs to govern our lives are his teaching and his example. We are meant to know him and we are meant to love him and that is meant to be a love and a knowledge that translates into a lifestyle of obedience. And then thirdly, the call of Christ is a call to seek the kingdom of God. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This is a call that plunges us very much into the world. It is a call for us to seek a world, a country, a society, a community that is governed by the love of God. This on the one hand is about opposing injustice and oppression and everything that breaks down the dignity of human beings that uh, breaks down their freedom and that is limiting of them becoming the kind of person God intends them to become. But on the other hand, it is also a call to embrace those who are needy and those who are poor. It's about embracing those people that society pushes to the edges and the margins that society despises and looks down on. It is a, a call to embrace very much the life of Christ. The kingdom of God really defines Christ's life and ministry. And so this has been a very challenging week in South Africa. And as I listened to the news and I looked at photographs and video footage of what was happening, I wondered how many of the people that were looting and committing acts of violence called themselves Christians, were members of our churches and youth groups. And I wondered how many of the people who in some way have attitudes or behavior that in some way built the kind of country and society that allowed to happen what has happened. How many of those people were Christians you know, in our churches? Radio talk shows are endlessly analyzing, talking about what has happened. There's a great deal of blame being apportioned to this person and that person and this group and that group. A lot of talk about what actually has happened and what and who caused it. But in the context of what we have discussed this morning about the evil that Christians do, I believe that in the wake of what has happened this week, it needs to be a moment in which we reflect as Christians on our own lives, on the quality of our spirituality, on the, way, on, on the extent to which our spirituality conforms to that which Christ calls us to. And in the context of what has happened, that we ask ourselves two very hard questions. And the one is, has there been in any way in which my behavior, my attitudes, my biases and prejudices have perhaps built in some small way the kind of country that allowed to happen what has happened? And I think the second question that is a very important one for us to ask of ourselves is this. In what way can I participate in the healing of our land?
Today, let us spend time praying for our country. And even though we are in our own space at home, let us see ourselves joining hands with one another and praying for the healing of our land. Let us begin by praying for an end to the, destruct, to the violence and destruction. Let us pray for those who lost businesses and jobs. Let us pray for those who lost loved ones. Let us pray for those charged with restoring law and order. Let us pray for government and all in positions of leadership. Let us pray for healing at all levels in our society. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. 
we bless each other saying now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen.